All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining me today. I am Carol Stringer and I am the extension agent here in Fulton County. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about day lilies and how you can use them in your landscape. Let's see here, mute everybody. Yes. Okay, everybody, I have you all muted just for now. And if you um, have any questions as you think of them while I'm going through the presentation, um, feel free to drop them in the chat box and we'll discuss them all at the end. Let's see here. Okay, so this is a relatively fun presentation. It's a little bit shorter than our normal talks, but it does have a lot of really great information and I think you guys are gonna enjoy it. Um, so again, here we go. Let's see here. Okay, so daylilies um, are tough, very adaptable perennials that do very well in a very wide um, selection of climates and soil types and environments. So they are a really great perennial for um, tough areas of your yard. They're good for difficult parts, maybe high slopes. Um, and they're just a lovely addition to our landscape because they have such um, a wide range of color and um, flower type. A lot of people coming in. Um, they thrive in the eastern U.S. from all the way from Minnesota to Florida. So we have them from very cold environments all the way to very warm sort of subtropical environments. Um, they have a very wide range of soil and light conditions that they tolerate. They're not affected by a lot of diseases. They bloom very easily with very little input. Um, and all around are just a very tough and indestructible plant that does very well in our landscape here. So just to go over the plants a little bit themselves, they're not actually a true lily. They're in a different genus called Hemerocallus. Uh, this means that they just have one flower that lasts every day. And sometimes we don't notice that because what they will do is they will produce multiple flower blooms on each scape, which is the flower stalk here. Um, but each flower only lasts for a single day and then it will wilt and a new one will come up on the same uh, stalk. So there are some newer varieties that open in the evening and they'll remain open. But the overwhelming majority of them are just gonna be um, open for that single day. And many of them are fragrant as well. So they have a lot of nice color that they'll add to the landscape during their bloom time. So again, just to go over the horticulture part, the flower stem is called a scape and each scape on the plant will produce multiple flowers during its blooming period, um, up to a dozen. So it'll bloom for several weeks. And there are some varieties, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, that will rebloom. Um, so they may have a period of blooming in the spring or in the early summer, and then another blooming period later in the fall, which is kind of a nice little addition. Um, but there are, now we have so many varieties in a wide range of colors. There's thousands and thousands of varieties out there. Um, and they're all hybrids of a number of species. So this is a kind of a wide genus, uh, got a lot of diversity going on with color and height and size, shape of the flower. Um, so it's really nice. Um, and typically we can get them anywhere from one to four feet in height. So you can get kind of some ranges there. You can do different things with them. Um, some of those dwarf ones do really well as a border. So you just have to think about how you want to use them inside your landscape. So as we're talking about the plants themselves, I want to just talk about their roots for a little bit. Um, so when we think about a perennial, a lot of times we think about a bulb, right? So a tulip has that sort of true onion looking bulb that's just kind of like a round ball. Um, and each year it'll produce, you know, stalks and foliage from that bulb. Uh, daylilies are not like that. They're rhizomatous and these tubery looking roots that you see here are the rhizomes. Those are the plant's storage organ. Uh, that's how it's going to store its sugars and its water uh, during periods of drought and during the fall as well. But you can also tell that this root structure is going to be great for holding in soil. So this daylilies do very well on a sloped area, especially if it's in full sun. 
And this is why they have this really tough uh, roots that just kind of uh, do great at kind of anchoring those plants in place. So they're not truly a bulb, they are a true perennial, but they're not a true bulb. They have kind of a rhizome. And another uh, kind of typical perennial that you see that has this structure is an iris. So typical bearded irises have these kind of rhizome looking roots that really help them anchor into the soil. So just a little note about the species. Like I said before, there are thousands of cultivars um, and there are a number of species within this genus that, that are crossed over to be, uh, to produce the commercial types that we see. Um, there's only a couple that I'm gonna talk about just briefly here. The only one that uh, is really of concern to me is this tawny lily, and that's the traditional one that we see all over the place. Uh, it's naturalizing in some parts of the United States now, and so it's been labeled as quote unquote a category three exotic plant. Um, so it is something that just to keep in mind, it's not as much of an issue here in Georgia as it is in some of the neighboring states, but it does spread and quite with, with no help at all from us, it'll spread and kind of naturalize in, in, um, in an abandoned areas and things like that. You'll see it on old homesteads or cemeteries or kind of places like that. Just something to keep in mind when you're selecting plants. And then the night blooming and fragrant lemon lily or citrus lily, or I'm sorry, citron lily are both kind of attractive yellow lilies. They look very similar. The night blooming of course is just one that opens its flowers at dusk and kind of they close at the beginning of uh, at dawn. So those are really cool and they're good for night pollinators as well. So hardiness, like I mentioned before, daylilies have a very wide range in the United States that they uh, can survive in. So typically when we order plants, I'm sure all of you are familiar with hardiness zones. If you aren't, that's something that you'd wanna look up your zip code and see what your hardiness zone is. Um, here in Atlanta, we're right on the edge of 7B, 8A kind of, depending on what part of the metro you're in. So if you're south of us, you're probably an eight or higher. North of us, you're in the sevens or above, of course. So it's one to look for. But daylilies are quote, regional performers. So you're gonna wanna find some that are suited to this area, suited to the area that you live in and do really well here. Um, and one of the best ways to do that would be to look at a daylily society's website and they'll have some local growers who would be uh, able to supply you with cultivars that are going to do really well in your climate. And I'll talk about that at the end. I've got some links for you guys to look at, especially of some of the daylily societies that here that can connect you to those local growers. So like I mentioned before, there are thousands of different types um, and most of the daylilies that you're gonna be able to purchase commercially are hybrids. And that's very typical of all of our ornamental plants. Um, so we have all these different varieties now um, and they can vary in their color, um, shape of the flower. Is it double, is it single, is it trumpet shaped? Uh, how tall is the scape, the flower stalk? You know, is it very close to the ground or is it quite tall? My mom has some, they're super attractive. The variety is called Carrots Forever and it's a bright orange, but it has a super tall scape. Uh, it's not close to the ground at all. So it has these kind of springy looking little stalks and that's really nice. Um, if you want that, you know, you might want something that's closer to the ground depending on where you've got it in your yard. So there's also bloom time. That's something to think about in your landscaping. If you have a big area you wanna put daylilies in, you might consider getting some that bloom at different times of the year. So that way you kind of have a transitional color from one group to the other. Um, and we'll also talk about those rebloomers too here in just a minute, but just look at the lovely like color variations that we're getting in these different ones. You've got these sort of spidery looking types. And I just wanna mention that these are not the same as a true spider lily or a cranium lily. Those are a totally different plant, which is also really interesting. Um, and if you aren't familiar with craniums or uh, swamp lilies, those are some you should check out because they're really neat. Um, and you see them a lot in places like Florida and Louisiana, but um, these are different. These are just spider shaped day lilies. 
There are other ones that are, have unusual forms. We've got super large blooms all the way down to miniatures. So a lot of variety. Um, and this is something else too. And without getting deep into the weeds with genetics on this, I just want to mention this in case you're out there looking on online catalogs or anything like that. And you might see these two words, diploid and tetraploid. And I just wanted to quickly touch on them. Um, so diploid just refers to the chromosome number of the, of the plant. And plants have a lot of kind of flexibility with their um, reproduction and cellular situations, way more than you know mammals or anything or like that. So we have the ability to manipulate those very easily in plant breeding. Um, so tetraploid flowers have a double serving of genetic material. They just have double the amount of chromosomes. And so what that does for a plant is it makes it more showy. It's more uh, larger foliage. It has larger flowers. It has more showy colors. Um, and as you can see, these are some really unique funky plants down here. Uh, like these are not your typical daylilies that you're going to find at Lowe's, right? So these are very ornate, extremely showy. Um, and that's just all that that means. The, that's what the tetraploid versus diploid means. The diploids are more of your uh, like old fashioned varieties that you would see. And there's nothing wrong with either one of these, right? So this, um, all, all of that means is that it just has more chromosomes. And I also just want to say that doesn't mean that it's GMO, right? So it's not genetically modified. It doesn't have anything inserted into it. It just has double the amount of material. So that's kind of just some food for thought, but it does produce a lot of some really attractive flowers that are more showy than what you would normally find. Um, we also have miniature and dwarf varieties, which are extremely useful in landscaping um, because they can be quite compact. Uh, this one is kind of the, the ultimate gold standard, Stella de Oro. You see it everywhere. Um, it's used extensively in landscaping. It does really well as a ground cover. Um, and it also has this great quality of being able to rebloom. So it'll bloom in the earlier summer and then it'll bloom again kind of periodically up until frost, which is really nice. Uh, so you have kind of continuous color, especially if you're using it as, um, it, I'm sorry, kind of like erosion control or any kind of a big swath of flowers, you know, so you're gonna get that color in a big area, which is nice. So this is just continuing about the rebloom and how explaining here. So you might see, here's some another good list of those varieties that rebloom. Happy Returns is another one. It's another kind of miniature looking one. They've got Mini Stella, um, Raspberry Frolic, Serena Madonna. All of these are just smaller um, reblooming types. So if you're really into that and you're interested in having something that's gonna have that burst of color early in the spring and then later on in the year, look into some of these types and they'll get each one will be probably a little bit different but you can look into them and see what time of year they're going to bloom for you and if it's our summer mid late fall whatever so a lot of variety there but it is pretty cool um and so this is something that i actually didn't know anything about but it is new to me and it's pretty cool um, so the overwhelming majority of daylilies are the traditional perennials that go dormant in the fall. So I, I um, the, all the ones that I've ever grown, they die down in the fall and then they kind of re-sprout back in the spring. That's the 90% of them, you know, that's their typical growth cycle. They have that cold um, temperatures kind of help them stimulate their regrowth in the spring. Um, so this is the majority of all of our daylily cultivars, but there are these um, reblooming and semi-dormant, uh, it's like evergreen and semi-evergreen types, and those do really well in places like Florida and South Georgia where you're not going to have those periods of cold as much, and so the, the, the foliage will remain green. Um, during the winter times and then it just blooms and kind of reinvigorates again in the spring. So I don't have any experience growing those because I've never lived in that climate, but 
they are out there if you live in some place that's more tropical. So it's just something to think about. Um, and just to, again with the reblooming, in order to kind of stimulate that, again, you can always remove those faded flower heads. That's another part. And so here's what I was sorry, I got ahead of myself on that. I apologize. Um, so the here's some of those semi evergreen and evergreen types that I was thinking of that do really well in the warmer climates. So if you are in South Georgia or Florida, even, you know, any of those kinds of areas, there are types that will just have green sort of grass, almost like liriope all, all year round. And then they'll just bloom in at their appropriate season in the summer. So it's just pretty cool. And you get that year round color. So here's a little, just a bit about the flower shape. So there's so many, so much variation in their appearance now we can get them spidery looking, we can get them miniature, different colors, full and round, some of them are ruffled. So they've really come a long way in plant breeding. They're not just the old traditional types any longer. Um, so if you really are interested in kind of a unique color, I definitely encourage you to go out there and look for it because it's probably available. There, there's been a really a lot of advances made in the last several years. And so there's just quite a bit more variety than there previously was. So here's what I was talking about earlier about the different periods of blooming. So when you have a certain type and you maybe you wanna have a large swath of daylilies or you have an area that's just exposed to sun all the time. Um, it might be an idea to have, if you don't have the reblooming type, to get some that bloom in early, mid, and late season blooms. So that'll give you a nice kind of transition of color throughout the, um, the growing season. And once you get those flowers established, look at this, right? So you can get up to um, like a couple hundred flowers per season because they just bloom continuously. Each plant's gonna be just churning them out day after day. So it's really a nice show of color. So now that we're thinking, of, we've got all, everybody's excited about what they're gonna go purchase them and plant. Um, so now we wanna think about the site and the soil type that you're gonna put your daylilies in. So they are adaptable to most soils and conditions, but they do prefer something that is a little bit acidic, uh, moist soil that's high in organic matter, but well-drained. That being said, day lilies are very tough. They um, tolerate a very wide range of soil and site conditions, and they will even tolerate um, wet conditions. So I recently gave a talk about rain gardens, they would be a great perennial choice for a rain garden if it's given full sun. Um, and you just want to make sure that, you know, of course, anytime you're going to put install a flower bed, it's always a good idea to do a soil test to get a kind of a result and see what you might need to amend to your flower bed. Um, but they really just do great in a lot of site and soil conditions. That being said, you want to make sure they have full sun if you can. Uh, so you want to give them, put them in the sunniest spot that you have because that's how they produce the most flowers. So if you put them in an area where they're not in that full extreme sun exposure, they will still flower for you probably. They're just not going to be as showy and as plentiful as they would be in that full sun. So a minimum of six hours is what you're going to need to get that. Um, but light shade can be good if you have some of those unique and kind of exotic types that have dark colors. It keeps that dark color looking fresh and not faded out. Um, and then finally, you might want to avoid any areas that are going to be underneath trees or shrubs because they're just going to compete with nutrients and they're going to be shaded out pretty easily. So again, about the soil, if you have an area that is um, too wet, you, you want to avoid that and they're going to grow the best in kind of these sort of medium areas. Uh, and during that first growing season, you want to make sure that you're watering them plenty during the establishment. But typically, once they've become established, they do not need that additional water 
um, unless you're having just having a really strong drought that year. So another thing that would be nice is whenever you're installing them, um, we encourage you to use something like mulch because that'll help kind of suppress weed growth in those new beds that you've got. Um, and you're gonna wanna space them about a foot apart because they are going to expand over time. And now of course that's, some, that's just a general rule of thumb. So if you're getting a very large variety, you're gonna wanna space it further. Um, and those dwarf ones can be a lot tighter in the planting. So when you're online and you're shopping and you're finding all these fun flowers, you're gonna wanna make sure that you plant them within a few days of receiving them because it's just hard on a plant to kind of be chipped around and removed from a growing environment and then just to lay there kind of, you know, in the box or whatever. So you always wanna make sure that you get them planted and get them out growing there. And you wanna order them whenever it's either the spring or the fall when the temperatures are kind of cooled down. So really the best time to get those perennials established. So here's some ideas of some different site situations around your home that might be good. Um, you can put them around foundations and fence lines because they're good for kind of creating that low maintenance border. Um, besides a walkway or driveway, they look really nice like that in clumps of three in front of um, shrubs, kind of not too close because we don't want them shaded, but in clumps in front of tall grasses or other ornamental plants, they kind of do good at kind of softening those hard lines between just our turf grass and our trees or our other flowers, you know, so they kind of make a nice soft border. And some of the smaller ones will actually do pretty well in containers. So that's another option for you guys if you have a reduced area at your home. So this is the fun stuff, right? So um, again, just if you remember back to the roots, uh, if you have an area of your yard or that you're trying to, you know, a difficult area that is very sloped, it can be hard to find plants that do well in that environment, especially if you have very full sun, um, but daylilies will do really well there. So that's a good thing that they'll help hold the soil in with all those roots and um, they can even, tolerate that really well. But this is a really great idea. And I just love this because I also really like bulbs as we were talking about earlier. Um, so this is a planting of spring bulbs. We've got tulips mixed in here um, and it looks like some crocus as well. And if you know anything about bulbs, they come up and they're very exciting because it's spring and they're the only thing flowering right then. But then they kind of die back and their foliage kind of just subsides down as the higher temperatures come in. So mixing a bed like this with daylilies and something like tulips or irises can be really nice because as those spring foliages decline, you've got the summer foliage and flowers of the daylily coming in. So it's a good way to kind of have transitional color in a um, perennial bed. So just some maintenance stuff in the spring before that growth gets going, you're gonna to wanna to remove those dead leaves and kind of pull them back. You're gonna to wanna to do any kind of weeding. Um, you're gonna to wanna to keep the soil moist and apply any mulch if you need to between plants. Um, and again, if you're in an area of the state that has really sandy soil, you may be needing to water them a little bit more than the rest of us that are in uh, more of the Piedmont and up here in kind of North Georgia. Um, just because sandy soil drains so quickly, especially in the high heat days of summer. And again, of course, they do tolerate drought well, but a moist, well-drained soil is going to be the best for them. Okay, sorry. Okay, some more care instructions. So if you want to... Um, deadhead the flowers throughout the summer that will help stimulate more flowers to be produced by the plant um, because otherwise what will happen is those flowers will produce seed in the ovary here um, as you guys can see so if you by pinching those off after the flower is done blooming that will kind of help continually stimulate the plant to produce more flowers and as those scapes are done and you can also prune those back off. Okay. 
So in the fall, unless you have some of those evergreen varieties, the, uh, the foliage is going to turn kind of yellowish and look sort of sickly and sad and decline. Um, so you can cut it off right then. That's not a problem at all. Um, but you can also wait until spring to kind of just do the cleanup, cut those dead stalks and, and uh, leaves off and just kind of rake it all up. And I just want to intersect here. Um, just for you guys to think about this because this is kind of a unique thing and I don't always feel like it's a huge deal, but it is. Um, so if you are purchasing a plant that is patented, it is forbidden to reproduce that plant. So if you see something and you're, you know, you're looking at a catalog and it has this kind of string of numbers with PP in the beginning of it, it's likely means that it's patent protected. Uh, you are forbidden from replicating the plant, splitting it and um, giving it away to your friends or neighbors. It is just something to think about when you're purchasing plants, if that's something you wanna do in the future, maybe don't do it with those varieties just because it is kind of frowned upon. Um, and if you're concerned about a flower and you're not sure if it's protected, you can always look it up on the US uh, Patent Trademark Office. And typically though, when you're purchasing a, a flower from an, a, a catalog, it's gonna say right there that it's patent protected. So just like here, this is a really attractive daylily. I looked it up after um, the other day and I was looking at it because these are just such a cool uh, foliage. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, petals. It's got a really nice color pattern. So, but this one right here, it's got the, Hemerocallis, which is the genus of daylily. Inkheart is the variety and then patent protected. So this one is still under patent. Over time, they do kind of roll off. And so then they become kind of common at that point. You can divide them and give them away. You can propagate them yourself for your home use. But if you purchase one that is patent protected, you should do your best to not duplicate that if you can which is actually kind of hard because daylilies need to be transplanted and divided a lot, in, I think. Um, so this is one that really helps daylilies a ton. Uh, so dividing them will really stimulate the original plant and grow more. So after about three or four years, you're gonna notice that that clump will kind of become really crowded and will kind of be less vigorous. It's just kind of start to look not as good, it's just gonna kind of decline a little bit. So what you can do is begin to divide them. Um, and I've got some nice pictures for you guys here. So here's a big clump of daylilies that had just become a little bit too large for their site and they needed to be split up. So they've been dug up, we've got them in a wheelbarrow here. Um, we've kind of knocked off most of the soil and then we've sprayed it off and kind of trimmed down some of those roots. And then um, we've taken that tool and just kind of broke up the plant. And now we have like 30, 25 plants that we could plant and go landscape with at our house and, you know, take and we could plant them back here somewhere. You know, there's just a lot of, now you have a lot of plants that you can use after from that one huge Cluster. So one really big clump will, uh, will um, produce a lot of individual plants that you can use in your landscape. And if you don't want to do that, or if you don't have room for them, if you want to split them up, you can always give them away as long as they're not patent protected and because um, other people can use them too. So they're quite easy to plant. So after you've gone through the process of splitting them up or getting ready to transplant them. You wanna make sure you have plenty of roots on each of those little pieces or just at least some root on each piece. Uh, so you wanna dig the soil down to about 12 inches and kind of get it nice and loose and loamy. And if needed, you would wanna add some compost or um, fertilizer if your soil needs amended. Uh, then you're gonna place your daylily in the hole and just make sure that the crown is poking up about an inch is above the soil line and you're done because that's going to make sure that that growing point isn't too submerged. 
and then they'll kind of come up and be blooming. So that's good. So very little effort to propagate daylilies. They readily will sprout from just a small piece with very little root. They do quite well with this and they're very st stimulated by having that division. So that's something that I do wanna stress with their routine maintenance is that you will probably be spending some time uh, every several years dividing them. It's not a bad thing, I don't think. Uh, so even though they are extremely healthy and they don't have a lot of problems, I will just mention a couple of things right here. They do have an aphid that affects them at times. I personally have never seen it. It's just a pest that will feed only on daylilies. So if you have tons and tons of them, you might notice a problem. Um, it is something that's typically found during the cooler weather and it will hide within the, the leaf fans, the folds of the leaves themselves. A spider mites are another one that's kind of similar and it's kind of most active during this hot dry periods but both of these can be controlled by just blasting them with water and just kind of rinsing the plant off and and those little guys are just so tiny they just kind of fall off and they're not as much of a concern the other thing you can do is use horticultural oils and soaps um, and those are things that will kind of coat the plant and kind of coat the insect and just kind of suffocate them. So finally, as I mentioned before, there's some resources for you guys, uh, especially this one right here. The American Daily Society has a ton of great information and I'll actually put that in the chat for you all. Let me get that one pulled up here. So this one has a great list on it. Let's go to the chat. You can put in your um, what area you live and it'll have resources for you within your state of people that are locally growing daylilies and producers that are producing regionally adapted cultivars. So I definitely encourage everyone to look at that website. Um, and then if you're here in Atlanta, there's a couple different daylily societies. Um, they're also really helpful and can be have a lot of great resources and recommendations of different types. So if you're if you're not in Atlanta, I encourage you to look in your in your own area and see if there are daily societies because they will have a lot of really good information for you all. Um, okay, so at this point, this is the end of my little presentation. It's only half an hour today, so I'm gonna stop my screen share, and I'm gonna answer some of your questions. Um, so Lynn, actually that was Phyllis, if I remember correctly, asked about planting in containers and yes, you can. So some of those dwarf varieties actually do pretty well in a container, especially like Stella de Oro. And I think there's one called Mini Stella now as well. That one would be great. Um, removing the dead leaves at the base of the plant. So, um, in the fall, you'll see the, the foliage die back to the ground and it'll kind of shrivel up and look really sad. And um, that's what, honestly, my personal preference, that's probably when I would go out there and do it unless you had just tons and tons of flowers. I would cut it off, I'd leave maybe an inch of stalk above the ground. I cut it off about an inch above the ground and just kind of pull those desiccated leaves off and it should be fine until the spring. Um, so Bill asks, when's the best time to divide, spring or fall? I think you could do either. Personally, I would do probably in the fall because that's kind of when the plant's becoming more dormant. Um, it allows the those sprigs to kind of become more adapted in those cooler temperatures. If you do it in the spring, you kind of run the risk of having to water them more often. And that's okay, it's just kind of your personal preference, but they're more likely to be hotter temperatures can be hard on a newly transplanted sprig, so. Oh, Judy asked about rust. Okay, let's see here. I do actually have a slide about rust. Let's pull it up and I, I took it out. So I'll pull it back up. Mm -hmm. Let's see here, I saw my screen share. Okay. 
So Rust, and I just didn't include this for sake of time, but uh, it is something that does affect um, daily sometimes. And if you guys are familiar with corn rust, it looks very similar. It has those kind of orange blister pustules on the underside of the leaf. Um, Daylilies are, I believe they're also monocots, so they're affected similarly, but it's a disease, it's windborne. Um, if you have had problems with this in the past, I would encourage you to, to um, plant resistant varieties. So here's a good list of some, and I don't know these specifically. I can drop this little list here into our chat box. Let's see. Maybe chat. Okay. I can't, I will drop it in the chat box when it comes back up. I'm sorry, you all. I'm not sure why it's not wanting to pull up for me. But the other things really are just to keep the foliage clipped. If they're, you're seeing that as a problem, I would make sure to space them appropriately when don't keep them too close. So this is when that division would come into play. Um, dividing them frequently, perhaps more frequently than three to four years, maybe every two years, would kind of help keep good airflow around them. And good airflow allows kind of creates an environment that's difficult for a pathogen to get in, get started. Um, so that's one thing I would do. And then if you're having a drought, the other thing is that you can, uh, when you're watering those plants, do not just go out and dump the water on top of it. Kind of lift up the foliage and water right at the roots. The wet foliage can really um, kind of just creates an environment for the disease that does, Basically, wet foliage equals can equal illness for plants. So that's something we want to try to reduce if possible. Okay, so I'll stop my share and then I think I can paste. There we go. Okay, so those, that's the list of the varieties that are resistant to rust. Okay, so fertilizing. Okay, so everyone, if you're going to fertilize, I would encourage you to soil test to see what nutrients your soil actually needs. So um, rhododendron fertilizer, without knowing exactly what was in it, I'm not sure that I would recommend it. They are an acid loving plant. Um, so they may have something in that fertilizer that's going to kind of reduce the pH of the soil. I don't know that I recommend that. Um, I would kind of look and see what's in your fertilizer. But again, really the best thing that you can do is do a soil test, which will tell you what kind of nutrients need to be added to the soil in order to get it to the right um, pH and nutrient balance for your ornamental plants. And if you're just looking for a generic fertilizer to use on um, ornamentals. I would say the most important thing, if you're not familiar with fertilizers, I would encourage you to read up on them just a little bit. Typically when you go to the store, they're gonna have three numbers on them and that's what you wanna look for. It's N, P, and K. So if you find something that's 10, 10, 10, that's a very common fertilizer. It's 10% nitrogen, 10% potassium, or 10% phosphorus and 10% potassium. So I wouldn't go any higher than 10, 10, 10. If you find something that's like 958 or you know 966, something like that, that would probably be okay. It's very low, but it still adds a little bit to your plant. So I would keep it 10 or lower it would be a good suggestion in all the categories. But again, if you're putting in a really large bed, I would still do a test. Um, is it too late to divide daylilies in zone five? I don't think so at all. I think this is a great time because zone five, you're like in Ohio, Indiana. So I'm guessing, so that would be still kind of springy temperatures. It's not getting too hot yet. So you should be fine. Honestly, even if they're, they're very hardy. If you go out there and you divide them, even when it's a little bit hotter, they're still going to be completely fine. And as long as you water them, they will, they'll come on. Oh, Dagmar, um, prote protecting the buds from being eaten by deer, no. <laughs> I don't have any um, suggestions for that. Deer are just a problem. Um, 
really with ornamentals, there's not a lot you can do. I've heard people do, there's all kinds of old wives cells to kind of keep deer and rabbits from eating your plants from blood meal to using chicken wire or different kinds of have heard hair bits of that, but I, I don't recommend any of those. The only thing that's going to keep a deer out is fence period, which is kind of sad, but I don't know about that. Um, and regarding the wet foliage, when it rains, don't worry about them. It's just something that if you have had rust in the past or other disease issues, one of the things you can do to manage rust is to not water the foliage when you're out there with the hose and stuff. Um, and okay, so if you're Riley asked if they're going to bloom after dividing now. So if you divided them right now, depending on the cultivar that you have, I would, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to say no, because the plant is kind of being shocked a little bit when you divide it. Um, so it probably will take another, at least one growing season to get those sprouts back blooming again. And then if you're pleasant, you might be pleasantly surprised with a couple of them, but it's likely that they'll just kind of be dormant for a little bit. You might get some of them to bloom. That's a, you know, I'm thinking about this now. I guess it just depends on the cultivar and how big the little, how big the new plants are. Because ultimately what you're doing is creating new plants from one big old plant, right? So those new plants need to get that energy back up to where they can produce a flower. So they may be stunted for a couple of months and they may not bloom immediately. They may bloom later in the summer after they've kind of become established, but they're not going to be as full of blooms as they would have been in a normal year. The next year they should be back to normal though. Oh, the dead heading. Okay, let's see, let's see. Divide in the fall. If you divide in the fall, they should bloom the next year, I would think. Just to answer Raleigh's last question. Okay, the dead heading, I'm gonna be honest with you all. I have not done that myself much, only with, Let's see if I can find that again. Okay, let me pull back up my... Okay, so here's our deadheading slide. So I'll just say, I've had a couple of different kinds of daylilies in my home garden before. Um, the miniature ones that are kind of just small and they're less showy, I haven't ever deadheaded those and I've never had any problem with the deadheading, but I um, have had a couple of types that were more showy, um, kind of big cultivars. Actually, it was the one I mentioned earlier. It's called Carrots Forever. It's one that my mom had, um, but those would produce these really pronounced uh, scapes and flower buds and you could definitely deadhead that one and it helped kind of stimulate it to keep going because those are not where the the scape is so much higher than the foliage it's more apparent whenever those blooms are spent so you, you know you're out there and it's more visible you can just kind of pinch them off that's that's really the best advice i would have for you is just to pull these spent flowers off that day this the second day afterwards and it'll just kind of keep stimulating the plant to produce more of them. It's not um, anything that you need to, the, you know, like there's no art form to it. I would just go out there and just pull them off, you know, once they look shriveled up. And then once that scape is done, once that entire flower stalk has quit blooming, you can cut it back to the ground. And that's what they're doing here in the middle. So hopefully that answers your questions. And so I am going to not share the PowerPoint, but I am going to put this video onto our YouTube channel. Um, and actually, I apologize. I have one more thing for you all. If you guys have um, a couple of minutes, I would really appreciate it if you filled out my survey, because this helps me. Okay. 
surveys just really help us understand what people are looking for in their programming. And um, if you guys enjoy a presentation and the material and just helps us with coming up with our next ideas and um, just gathering information. So if you guys have a moment to fill that out, I would really appreciate it. And I will go ahead and stop our recording.